On this week's Ask GC Anything, we shall be discussing leg length discrepancy, ceramic bearings, riding over cattle grids, and a whole lot more. First up though, a question in on Twitter from Tom Mason. I currently ride 23 millimeter Conti tires, but I'm heading over to Belgium for a few days. Should I put 25s on for the cobblestones? Yes. Most definitely. And in fact, if your frame set will accommodate them, I would suggest going even larger than that to 28 millimeter tires. Your tires are of course the first point of contact with the ground, or the only point of contact in fact, and they do the best job of anything on your bike at absorbing the shock and vibration from the road surface. And of course there is a lot of that when you're riding over cobblestones. The benefit of riding larger volume tires is that you can run them at a lower pressure without an increased risk of pinch punctures. And I can tell you firsthand that the difference in comfort over the cobblestones is absolutely massive. In fact, earlier on in 2017, Matt and Cy did some testing of three different types of bikes over the cobblestones of Paris-Roubaix. Admittedly, it's slightly over the border in France rather than Belgium, but the same things do apply. And the results are quite interesting. Take a look at this. We're going to put three types of bike through their paces here, and arguably one of the most infamous sectors of pavé in the world, the Carrefour de l'Aube in France, made famous, of course, in Paris-Roubaix. Yeah, we are each gonna ride a road bike, a cyclocross bike, and a cross-country mountain bike through this tough sector as fast as we possibly can to see which one is the quickest. Don't forget that if you would like to ask us a question, you can leave it in the comments section below this video or indeed on Twitter using the hashtag TalkBack. And that is where this next question came in again from Michael Samuel. As an 18 year old aiming to race, what sort of training should I be doing? And is there any other advice that you can offer? Well, this is a question that we get asked quite a lot in comments and on Facebook, etc. Now, since you haven't raced before, it can be quite a daunting prospect, but it needn't be because the only person that's going to have any expectations on you is you yourself. So you should go to your first race with the aim of getting some experience and most of all having some fun. In, quite, in terms of training though you should be specific to the event that you want to enter so try to analyze the demands of that particular race. Firstly how long it's going to take you i.e the duration of the race. Secondly the type of terrain is it hilly is it flat and thirdly how many corners are there is it on a short circuit almost like a criterium with loads of corners where you're going to be doing lots of short sharp sprints or is it a longer road race maybe from A to B or on a long circuit where you're going to be uh, required to put the power down through the pedals for longer spells. Once you've decided what the specific demands of that race are, you'll have a better idea of what you need to work on. And we've got loads of videos here at GCN which should help you to prepare and train for those specific demands. In the meantime though, this one is definitely going to be of benefit to you. It is GCN's How to Prepare for Your First Race, which we shot in California a couple of years ago now. So, how do you go about training for your very first race? Well, here's a few tips. The first thing that you should do in your planning is to break down the demands of the race. If there have been previous editions, take a look at how long it's roughly going to take you. And also take a look at the type of course that it is. Is it hilly, is it mountainous, or is it completely flat? Rapid fire round now, although knowing me, it will probably just be the fire round. Uh, it will be hot, but I won't be very quick. First up, Peter Cody, hashtag talkback, hashtag ask Matt Stevens. Sorry if you're disappointed that it's me. Can I use 18 to 23 millimeter tubes with 25 millimeter tires? Yes, yes you can. You only need to inflate the tube outside the tire to realize that it will go quite big, much bigger than a 25 millimeter tire. So it will fill that volume absolutely fine. Don't need to worry about that. There might be a very, very small discrepancy in terms of the thickness of the inner tube when it's pumped up inside a 25 millimeter tire and therefore a minute increase in the risk of puncturing. But it's so small in this case as to not really be worth worrying about. Kevin Miguel, also on Twitter, asks, are ceramic bearings and pulley wheels worth the upgrade? Do they really make you go faster? Well, there's a whole lot, uh, other, things that you, a whole lot of other things that you need to be concerned with first. First and foremost, the power that you're putting through the pedals and your aerodynamics and the weight of you and your bike. If you've got all of these things sorted though and you feel like you can, can't get any further, then things like rolling resistance and the friction of your bike will make small differences. So the friction in the hub bearings and in the drivetrain, etc., as well. So if you've got everything else done and you've got some spare cash, let's face it, then they will make a small difference, yes. Jake asks, this reminds me of a question I had recently, why don't pros ride with 56 by 39? It would make attacking on downhills a lot easier. 
Well, the pros do like to tend to stay in the big ring as much as they possibly can. On a rolling terrain with a 56 on, that would be quite difficult. Some pros, especially sprinters, are known to go with a 54 when the finish is particularly quick. And we did also hear a rumour that Chris Froome used a 54 at last year's Tour de France en route to attacking on that descent and taking a stage victory, although we have no confirmation of that. And of course, in time trials, we regularly see 56 or even 58 teeth chain rings. Next Next up, from Tobias Corral, what is the best way to account for length difference in legs regarding shoes and saddle? Not my area of expertise, but I've been trying to do some research online. Uh, it seems that you could try a thicker inner sole. That's not ideal though, because it will affect the fit of your shoe or even different length cranks on either side. Again, not an ideal solution. I think the best solution to your problem is probably to try a cleat riser. So a small block that goes between the cleat and the shoe on your shorter leg. Uh, not that easy to find online, I have to say, but they are out there somewhere. So if you do some research, you should be able to buy some. It might even be something that you can make yourself if you are far more clever than I. Next up, uh, Iconic Extreme. I have recently got back into cycling after a long break from it. One thing I've always had an issue with is cattle grids. After a few scary moments, I now get off and walk over them, but wondered if there's a technique to ride over them safely. Well, this is my area of expertise because I come from the New Forest and there are cattle grids all over the place. And I have to say, I think I'd find it more dangerous walking over them than riding over them. So your technique is to approach them head on with a decent amount of speed, enough that you don't have to pedal over them and make sure that you're not doing any turning or any leaning whilst you're going over the category, particularly when it's wet because they can be slippery. And also pay attention to gaps that you sometimes get down the middle of cattle grids as well. They can be particularly dangerous. Uh, but approach it like that and you should have no problems at all in getting over them. The other thing you can do is just raise yourself out of the saddle ever so slightly and absorb that, those bumps uh, using your arms and your legs. Next up, Lucy Hammonds writes in and says, I'm 14, I've been cycling for over a year now. Uh, I love it and I've just somehow convinced my parents to get me a Live Envy Advanced 1. Uh, nice one. Uh, I live in a quiet town in North Wales with lovely roads around, but my parents hate me going riding alone. I'm only allowed on certain roads. Uh, well, I think that's all the question that we need to hear, really. I understand your parents' concerns. I've got a 14-year-old lad myself, and it can be particularly nerve-wracking letting him go out on the roads on his own, despite the fact that he is very responsible, as I'm sure you are. I would suggest firstly trying to find a nice quiet local circuit which your parents know which you can do in either direction with local terrain just riding that multiple times. The second thing that you could do is use some kind of app which shares your location. Now you can do this now uh, on Google Maps or indeed you can do it on a Wahoo Element Bolt or other head units as well. That way your parents will be able to see exactly where you are at all times and that should also alleviate some of their concerns. Or you could find a slightly older and more experienced riding partner uh, that you both trust to go out riding with then you won't be on your own. Next up and finally actually on the rapid fire round which has been particularly slow this week from James Lewis. I've mixed up my jockey wheels I wonder if you guys could help out and confirm which is the new one and which is the old one. Tough one that. I think it's the one on the... No, not sure. Not sure if you can help James, please leave your answers in the comment section down below. Our penultimate question came in from Arna Says. I'm gonna paraphrase slightly, but he has gone in the last four months from being a weekend warrior to also adding in three commutes each week, uh, 10 kilometers each way to work and back. And he's starting to feel that his legs are empty no matter what he has tried. So he's asking for tips uh, or does he keep training and hope it gets better soon? Well, to me, Anna, it sounds like you need some rest. You have ramped things up pretty quickly over the last four months, and it might just be that your body hasn't been able to absorb all that workload, hence why you're feeling tired and your legs are feeling empty. You are going to lose little to no fitness at all over the course of seven easy days, so that would be my first suggestion. Uh, it will likely allow your body to absorb all that work, repair itself, and that is, after all, something that we all neglect from time to time. This next video might help you have that easy week. Some research that Cy and I did into the best way to do a recovery ride. Essentially, how to take things easy, which really is my area of expertise. Check it out. Now, before we start to explain exactly how to do a recovery ride, what actually is one supposed to do then? Well, it is a way of gently boosting blood flow around the body through gentle exercise. And then the theory is that it will help deliver nutrients to your damaged muscles and also start to flush out some of the waste products from them that will have accumulated through hard training. 
How then do you do a recovery ride? Well, they really are quite simple. All you need to do is ride at a very low intensity for quite a short period of time. So 60 minutes at a maximum, at an effort level of between one and two if you're going on feel. You should basically be able to breathe through your nose throughout. Final question now, I'm afraid. Don't forget to keep them coming in the comment section down below. Uh, it comes in from Swanee, again on Twitter. Hi GCN, I'm moving to a much flatter area of university. Will I lose hill climbing ability and what should I do to combat that? Well, if you do only flat riding, you make no effort to simulate the types of efforts that you'll do on climbs, then yes, there is the chance that your climbing ability will wane ever so slightly. But the good news is there are loads of things that you can do to simulate the efforts that you will do on longer climbs. Uh, the first of those is to find a nice quiet row with as few junctions as possible and do some longer 20 to 30, maybe even 45 minute intervals on those. You can also do some longer intervals on an indoor trainer, they're very effective, or you could do what we've a lot of pros doing recently which is use an air hub which artificially increases the resistance of your wheels the opposite in fact to ceramic bearings but it gives you almost an extra 200 watts of resistance so it is hard to push against the handy thing is we've got all of our tips for training for climbs when you live in a flat area in this next video so make sure you watch this one thing i wish i'd done though is better utilize some of the terrain next to my house because local to me there's an abundance of fire roads and gravel roads like this one which all link up and that's perfect because there's no junctions and of course there's no traffic as well plus you've got the extra resistance off-road which perfectly mimics the kind of resistance and power that you're going to have to put out when you're on a longer climb. Well I'm afraid that's it for this week's Ask GCN and keep your questions coming we'll do our best to answer them on next week's show. If you've liked this video give it the thumbs up down below you can subscribe to the channel now by clicking on the globe and then we have got two more videos for you. Up there is my look at the latest lightweight and aerotech from the recent Eurobike show and down here we've got someone much better answering your questions. It's a recent Ask GCN thing with Adam Hansen.